it might disappear. Um, so here's JSON criteria. It's also in the main, um, in the documentation page. So there it is. Okay, thank you. You bet. Um, so we'll, we'll get a halfway through network um, chat. So um, the address, just like your house address, so if I decide to um, start running out the back of my house, I could go to Allegheny County and say, I want a, uh, I need a, a new address on Gasline Way, which is the name of my alley in the back. And they would assign me a mailable address. But my house is still my house. And your network adapter is still your network adapter. So the way um, Thomas mentioned um, NAT, which is network address translation. So what your router is actually doing inside of it, sorry, what your switch on the switch side is doing is it is making a mapping of the addresses that it assigns to the various hosts. And those addresses can change. The addresses are actually, um, you lease them from your switch for a given period of time and you can determine how long that is. Uh, but each computer has an innate fingerprint. Uh, I shouldn't say each computer, each network adapter has a unique fingerprint. So what the switch is maintaining in order to carry out network address translation is the hardware address, the MAC address, it's the, it maintains a mapping of Mac to um, IP. So this is what it uses for routing. And this is stable, or it treats it as stable and, it, and assumes um, that it is stable. And so if you want to start doing interesting network stuff, you can start tinkering with Macs, um, which is where you can start getting into some hot water with your network engineers at work. Um, and if you're tricky, they won't catch you. So if you look at... You're not supposed uh, to see that. <laughs> well, it's true. If you're tricky, they won't catch you. <laughs> um, if someone's good at playing with network spoofing, it's hard to, it's hard to figure out. You gotta be, you gotta be real good. Um, so my hardware address is this. Um, so my, e this actual ethernet adapter was Al the manufacturer of this Ethernet adapter was allocated a set of MAC address addresses that it assigns at the time of manufacturing the network card. And cheap network cards do not allow you to change your MAC address, and fancy network cards let you do uh, all sorts of things with your MAC so address. So the MAC address is the host number? No, uh, MAC address is the fingerprint of the host that the switch uses to, um, to uniquely identify that adapter and it assigns, so we'd say, it's not really assigning the computer an address, it's assigning that MAC address an IP address on that network. Okay, so the MAC address on the device doesn't change and that address makes the connection with the host or with the router and it gives it a host number yes exactly so we'd say that the the switch assigns a given mac fingerprint a ip uh, an internet protocol address for getting data to and from so uh for most home networks uh and business sub networks the the all of these 192.168.1 dots um no one on the outside of the world ever sees this. What it sees is the actual network address that was assigned by the ISP. Um, and then it sees the MAC address of the underlying system uh, so that when the traffic comes into the switch, it knows, oh, all the traffic for all these computers came in on um, 72, 162, uh, 84. And then it says, I need this to make it to the computer with the Mac address of blah, blah, blah. And the switch knows how to translate it into 
oh, I've got that host at 192.168.1.176, and it gets that traffic to there. Um, so let's go look at some of this. So jump onto the web. Um, this is all happening right before your very eyes. And so any given piece of data that you're transferring over the network is fundamentally routed uh, with the internet protocol for transferring packets of information around. Um, so open any web page. I'm going to open my web page because I know a lot about what's in the packets and hit F12, uh, which will open up your network system, your uh, uh, browser tools. And then we're going to click on network. Oh, I'm going to go over to Chromium because I like that one better. Browser tools? Yep. Uh, no, developer tools. It might be called browser tools. And so once you've pulled that magic window up, um, I'm using Chrome Meum, which is similar to Chrome, the Linux version of Chrome. And then I go over to Network. And then hit F5 again, refresh the page. So what we, what we see pop up here are individual files that were transferred to this computer from a remote system using the um, using a variety of protocols, the base level of which would be internet protocol. And if you click on any one of these, um, oh, I remember that picture. If you click on any one of these files, um, I want you to click headers. And so, um, inside headers, we get to see a little bit of the uh, inner workings. So my, my technology rediscovery server was assigned by DigitalOcean, my host, my uh, provider, my, VP, my um, uh, virtual host provider. So I have an internet routable address on that system of 104.236.104.185. So that's where this file called jars, header jars underscore 100x800 was requested from the server at 104.236.104.185. The colon, what comes after the colon? Uh, that's the house. Nope. Good guess. Very good guess. The port number? Yep, that's the port. So that's the, the door number um, of mm -hmm. that server. So um, there are standard ports. Internet uh, unencrypted goes on port 80. Encrypted internet is traditionally on 443. SSH connections on 22. Um, there's a... Uh, Wikipedia has is what's what does your VoIP run on? What's the standard VoIP port? I forget. Fifty sixty. Yeah. Standard port mappings. Ah, this is the one. And so you can think of every every internet address could have potentially 65,533 different port numbers. The first 1,000, um, the first big chunk uh, standard would be, I don't, I don't play under 1028. So um, the registered ports go up to about 1028. So certain um, programs will transmit their traffic on certain ports to avoid clashing with other programs. Um, so here's our two big ones, the ones that we'll, we'll use a lot. So 80, um, port 80 is an official port 
using in, using the hypertext transfer protocol for conveying data between computers. And so we have another protocol. So, so internet protocol is a standard for naming and routing traffic over the internet. And then any given port, any one of the 65,000 possible ports on each one of these computers could be transmitting information on its own protocol built on top of IP. And so we will be using Python that will uh, be using internet protocol as a base level communication and um, the HTTP or HTTPS with encryption um, for uh, getting data from a server. So 443 is also HTTP um, and then your encryption layer will handle scrambling it before it sends it over the network. Okay, so we've got the idea of a basic network. Now, uh, what's a server? Define server. Um, define a server. A host that does what? It serves. What does it serve? What do you ask for? <laughs> exactly. It responds to requests for information. Oh, uh, man. I knew I got you it. You got it. It's in you. Um, so a server is, what server would we technically think about a server as a program on a host that responds to requests for information passed to it on a standard set of ports. So the internet, um, the internet has a, uh, a whole bunch of routers that handle traffic getting to and from all sorts of other uh, locations. And so since this is so much fun, we're going to tinker a little bit with this. So um, any, given, any given request over a network to a server to get information might be routed through, at minimum, something like maybe 10 computers. So um, we can use, uh, let's see which ones are up now. Uh, these go, these change a whole bunch. Uh, Joanne, do you have a trace route that you use on the internet? Or do you have a proprietary one that you use? Uh, we use a proprietary one. No. You could just do a trace route from your. your uh, I can do that. Okay, I'll just show you. Um, so let's see where it goes trying to get to my system. So um, when my request uh, leaves my system, uh, it that request gets bounced through. Uh, so DigitalOcean is over here in New York. So DigitalOcean, here's New York. And so to leave my... Uh, once it leaves my copper, I guess now I'm actually fiber, unfortunately. I'm fiber out of the house. Um, so once my request to my server leaves my house, it has to find a way to get all the way to DigitalOcean that has exposed on it um, or that is receiving requests at, uh, what was my address again? 104 to so here's 104 this is internet routable 236 uh 104 185 and so the what what are we transmitting all of our requests um are passed in a bundle called a frame or more 
um, commonly known as a packet. And so that packet is, we can think about the packet as a, uh, a set of nested envelopes of information. And those envelopes each maintain information that's only relevant to the particular layer in your computer that uses it. And so this is incredibly efficient from a design standpoint. Um, so we can think about the, um, can think about how the, oh no, that's right, no 115 this term. Um, so I have a little graphic for this. Um, so here's the example of the network I built in grad school for one of my classes. So I had, um, so here's your internet. When it leaves, at the time I was using Xfinity, so when a frame leaves my network here to go onto the internet, um, the routing, the backbone routers on the internet use the piece of information in the outermost layer of the cake to do the routing. Um, and so th the way to think about it, I made this little graphic with a Wikipedia image of the layered cake, which is a browser is interested in data about how to display something on a screen and, um, and the internet doesn't care exactly, or, sorry, the browser doesn't care how that traffic made it through the internet. Um, and so the layered model, the OSI model, says that each layer is allowed to wrap information that it gets from the layer above it in any um, additional information that that layer needs. But each layer only needs to know how to pass data to and from what the layers that are adjacent to it. And so um, here's the official OSI model, which is um, at the very basic level, your router needs to know how to send ones and zeros on a physical medium. Um, and so packet and frame are both relevant. They're relevant in uh, layers that are next to each other in the media level. So this is to say when information is transmitted over the network, the only the essential information to get that packet to its destination is used by the individual routers. When it gets to the host where it's supposed to get to, that bundle, that, that chunk of data is then peeled back because once it makes it to the computer, we don't need to have information about where it needs to go. We want to have information about which uh, uh, relevant to the application that was requesting that data. And so when the, the clever thing about the internet routing process is that when that frame leaves my network, it doesn't know how to get to its destination. All it knows how to do is say, this is where I'm going. Do you know where this place is? And it asks the router that has approached, do you know where 104.236, 104.185 is? Does this, does backbone router A know this? And backbone router A can say, well, no, I don't but I know about backbone router B and I think it probably has a record of where that is. So it, the, the frame gets forwarded through the router to the, the next hop in the journey. And inside the routers, uh, routing tables are maintained to say something like, um, we know that backbone router C is able to respond to uh, is the one that's supposed to get all requests for 104, 236, 104. So any frame destined for 104, 236, 104 should go to backbone C. 
And so maybe backbone B is the one that maintain that knows about that link. Um, and so it would maintain a record in its routing table to say, um, if you want to get to uh, 104s, anything 104 dot whatever, uh, send it to backbone router C. If you want to get to uh, 188, 188 dot whatever, so 188s are living down on backbone F. And so these packets can be passed around um, a number of times before they get to their end destination. And so we can actually watch how this works. Um, I may not have this based on, uh, this is my new school computer. Um, And that's incredibly clever because what it means is that with the web structured the way it is, um, many route many backbone routers will maintain copies of other route other backbones routers tables. So even if there was a catastrophic loss of an entire chunk of backbone routers, the 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 traffic can be organically rerouted um, to the next available path. Um, what I didn't tell you is that. What it actually stores is much more complicated. As you imagine, it would store the, the, the destination range, the name, or in this case, the address of the server. I'm just using letters. And then it would store a route cost. So it would say, um, it's taking a long time to get traffic to C. For some reason, maybe this particular leg is very congested. So. Um, it can maintain a cost um, in in milliseconds or whatever the standard for cost is, and so it might say your your best bet is actually to go through F, and F will get you over to R, and then R will get you up to C, and that's going to actually be faster. So that all happens organically um, with for every every frame. Um, uh, Two thirty six. 104, 185. Okay, so th this is what we're, this is, uh, this is live tracer out right here. And so I'm not getting um, ping responses from a whole bunch of intermediate, uh, intermediate nodes, which is okay. Um, so you can see. You're not screen sharing. Oh, thanks. Oh no, you didn't see the magic? Okay, I'm clearing immediately. Okay, um, so now you can see the magic. So what Traceroute will do is it will ask each computer along a pathway to identify itself and to tell us um, some basic information about it. So I said Traceroute, so I said send a sample packet, a trace packet to 104.236.104.185 and the program uh, and the routing system knows how to cope with these routing packets and it will actually each one of the intermediate nodes will respond um, with information like its network identifier name. So it left my system here. Um, so this was my this is my router. So remember my computer here is um, 192.168.1.176. The router for all of my 192.168.1 networks is by default given the host number one. So the first place it went was this computer located about eight feet that way, which happens to be the little box that flashes. This is where it hit my first Verizon um, uh, local leg. And so it's internet routable address was 141.14.228. This host did not respond with trace route information. This host, who knows what this one is, we could do a, um, we could do a who is on that. So all these computers on the uh, internet maintain um, uh, 
public information about who owns that particular system. So when I built my technology rediscovery server, I decided to make my who is information public. And the moment I registered my domain name, I started getting eight to 10 calls a day from Indian internet companies trying to sell me software and services. It was very interesting. I would always register it publicly. I had a number of very interesting conversations. Um, and they, they, they end up dying off because there's so many coming through that they do the ones that come right up and then they move on to something else. So I can look up who is on this particular host and you can get all this public information. So this intermediate computer run by Verizon here, um, this is their ICANN registration information. Um, this is their CIDR breakdown. So they're running... Um, this particular registration applies to a chunk of addresses. Um, they all have an official mailable address associated with it, so you could go and knock on their door. Um, they posted a, you could open their registration in a, oh, look, look, look. Ever, did, you, did you see that? See what this is? Thomas? It's on. It's JSON, yeah, it gave, it gave me uh, this request. This is what we're gonna do after the break. So when I ask this host, rdap.arin.net slash registry slash entity, and then I asked for this identifier, what it gave me back was structured data in the form of JSON. And so this is what we're gonna do in Python. In fact, let's do it in Python. So get, grab your Python, we'll go parse this in Python. Um, in order to conduct uh, requests over uh, a network, we just use the request library. Um, and so we can ask a server uh, for data. And the last piece of information that I want to tell you before we jump into Python is that associated with a request using the hypertext transfer protocol is uh, what's called a method name. So you make a request to a server and you associate that request with a, uh, a method. And when you wanna get stuff, you use the get method, um, which says, I would like you to send me back information. And so when it sends you back information, it includes uh, what we call like wrapper information. So you can imagine a gift has stuff on the top, or maybe not a gift, we don't need to be so, um, if we would just be more practical, like a, a, a UPS box has the outer routing information about who sent it, some barcodes, that's what we call the response headers, one of which is the status code, which anything in the range of 200 is by, by convention associated with success, um, and so you'll, you'll probably notice if Sometimes if you're working on um, uh, servers and you ask for something um, that it doesn't have, it will give you back a reply or response, um, but the header on that response will be coded to, con to suggest that in fact it was an unsuccessful get. So 400s are errors and 404 is the convention for I didn't find this resource I, I looked you got a you got a, a machine you got a computer I processed it but I didn't find S A D L J K F L S A at the root of this server so one of the things we'll do in Python is we will ask the response for its status code before we start taking it apart because the status code will tell us if it's worth taking apart the response. Um, if, if it wasn't a successful response, there won't be data in it that's meaningful to us. Um, so let's, let's try getting some of this ICANN information and then after break we'll go and look at some more structured data where we're asking for uh, data that we could parse. Um, so go ahead and pull open a uh, Python script um, it might be the case, we'll do a, a, a break and you may need to install the request library, which is uh, a light lift, but we can see if that, uh, if that's there. 
Uh, here. Let me open a new one. Okay, API. And it's amazing how um, streamlined uh, Python has made accessing network resources. So we'll say um, uh, network practice fall 20. Um, so start by importing requests. So the request library, um, if you just try running import requests, if you don't get a module not found error, then you've got the power of the networking system at your fingertips. And so when we make a request over a network, um, we assemble a, a request and then the request library will give us back a response object that we can then uh, start taking apart. So um, we can start by, uh, I'll do some commenting here, um, use requests to issue a get uh, user request to issue a request to a remote host uh, choose the appropriate uh, HTTP method um, by uh, by calling the corresponding function on the module. So that's, that's a fancy way of saying um, the request library has attached to it functions that correspond with each of the major HTTP methods. So um, the two ones that you'll probably use will be get and post. If you're, if you're trying to send information that's the result of a form, um, a post says I'm uh, I'm sending you data to be to be written into some other system. So I'd say 95% of all the internet traffic is get and post, and um, the other uh, methods are are uh, up to you to explore. So the get method is um, remarkably simple, even um, unsettlingly simple. Uh, one might say. So the only thing we have to tell uh, the get method is the address, the internet, the address of the host that we want to gather information from. So let's let's try doing this with our um, ICANN data. Where did my ICANN data go? So I'm going to grab this. No, this one. And I'm going to chat this out um, in case you want to ping this one yourself. Uh. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just drop this right in get. And I'm going to also load JSON because I got back data in JSON format. So get will give me back the response here. Um, I'll call it resp. Um, and then once I get that, I'm just going to see what's going on in it. So I could say um, resp dot status code and see if we got a successful output. Um, and then I can also try just dumping, see what Python gives me for my raw response. Okay, so this was successful. I got a 200. Um, and now I can start asking uh, the response object for its various attributes, like the header keys. Um, 
So let's, uh, let's go grab those. I'm going to say, um, uh, we can actually get the, let's start by just printing out the response dot text and see what we get back. Okay. So here's the JSON. Look at that. Look how cool. So this is a successful request. So I got a 200. So what I might, uh, what would make sense would be something like checking. So if what I got was 200, then I'll proceed to dump out inf uh, useful information. Um, so Now, once again, code, I don't see it in the dictionary on the on this uh, web page. I'm sorry, one more time. I don't see status code in the dictionary of this web page. I don't see it as a key. In, in the, oh, because this is the payload. This is the actual data. The response code is part of the headers. Um, so it's part of the wrapping. It's on the outside of the box. We opened the box and dumped the contents. That's what resp.txt give us rest.status code is looking only in the wrapping of the data. Okay, so we can't see it. We can, we'll get the headers here in a second. You can get anything it gave you back, but I just chose to not print out all the headers because what mostly what we're looking for is to make sure that the request was okay. Um, but that's the right question. Like, where's the response code? Mm, okay. um, that's part of the header. So, um, oops, sorry. So uh, this is cool, but it's also... Um, this is in the raw text form, so I could send this to um, to our friend Jason. So we could say uh, payload, uh, and I'll just feed it to Jason. And now I can loop over my individual key value pairs that I got. Um, uh, in here, so for um, KV in payload. Comment that out. Oh, um, string is no attribute read JSON dot load. Oh, load S, sorry, load string. There they are. Um, Oh, it's still stuck in a list. Okay, I had to do some more. Um, I had to do some more unpacking. But so this is the basic idea of the API: is that we're gonna um, we're gonna go make a request over the network. We're gonna make sure that the status code is in decent shape in the two hundred range, um, and and then we can start unpacking the response. Questions so far. Uh, We'll take a little break and then we'll try using an actual um, API for, for data. I shouldn't say actual. This is an actual API for ICANN data, for, for other data. <laughs> uh, yeah, Eric? Yes. Just wondering, like, what's the end goal here? Like, what are we doing? Yeah, great. So the end goal is you're going to choose a API that contains data about something you're interested in and you're going to ask an inquiry question related to that data and figure out how to make requests against that API in order to gather enough data to answer your question. And so I will show you before we go on break. Um, let's all take a look at. Where, uh, will we, where will we know where the APIs are? 
Yep, that's uh, all in our API module. Okay. Um, and I have, there's a big, huge website that lists thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through all that here shortly. So if you jump to our schedule, um, click on the API module, and um, you're all asking such good questions. Where are they? Well, there's a website called API directory at the programmable web. So you come here and it lists 26, 23,695 API. So if I'm interested in cars and I want to ask how much do cars cost that were made in 1963? Um, this is a list of um, servers that respond to requests and provide structured data in reply. And, um, and this website will give you links to the uh, API documentation for each given uh, tool. And so it would be useful for you to come down here to API Tracker and uh, open that and you can see what other people have done and you can test out their code and you can investigate all sorts of neat, neat things. So if you jump into this, um, Google Doc. I'm going to share out the link as well so you can start mulling. Um, I'm glad because it seems like you're itching to start grabbing data. This is where it all comes alive. Um, it's once you can start doing this. So I'm chatting this out. It's also in the module. Where did chat go? Come chat. Oh, there you are. Um, here's API. Project Tracker. Okay, so if you jump back to spring 2020, um, we had folks choosing, uh, we had almost, you know, almost the whole range, everything from um, cocktail recipe API, where you, excuse me, you can send the server an ingredient and it will send back a structured JSON file of drinks that use that ingredient. Um, we've had people do kind of fun stuff with uh, TV series. You can, uh, oh, someone opens up a database that lets you query against a database of TV shows. Um, had several folks do uh, financial modeling and um, we're, we're pulling index, index quotes. Uh, Zach was working on bird sightings. Kayla did whale sightings. So the uh, whale tracker folks have an API that lets you get the latitude and longitude for known whale sightings of various species. Um, so what I'll invite you to do to Rob's question is find a domain of interest and um, you can go back and forth. You, it'll probably be the case that for your first API project, you'll, you'll probably need to mold your question a little bit around what data is available through that API. Um, and that would be a good first pass to just get experience figuring out what kinds of requests uh, to make. Um, I encourage you to click on the documentation API because for each server, um, while the HTTP protocol, how you make the request is standardized, um, the API endpoint refers, the notion of an API endpoint uh, is uh, exactly how you make the structured request once the packet gets to the front door of the server will be specific to that API. Um, so you can see this is the whale sighting um, API. So the key will be to make it into the documentation page for each API. It will be designed for people like us using a tool that, make, that makes programmatic requests, not browser requests, but programmatic requests uh, to the server. And some of them are great, like this one is great. Some of them are poor, meaning they are wrong or they're not very well detailed. Um, so you can see for this whale sightings, um, all I have to do is append this string to the URL of the whale API server, and I can give it um, this JSON blob and say, I would like to see sightings for, um, oh no, this is the response. Um, get a count of all sightings. So if I just want to get a count of how many sightings they've got, I would ask them for at their root 
slash API slash counts dot JSON and it would send me back a number. Um, and so after break, we'll we'll take a look at how to how to build these out. Quick questions. Uh, I you can see me mentioning break. I need to take a quick break. Um, so let's see you in fifteen. Okay, have fun. Start looking. Start looking around. Start with the people from last term, um, and then you can start looking at programmable web if you want to venture off into the into the wild world of the internet. I'll leave you with uh, some sounds of Wikipedia while we're working.
All right, and we are back. Welcome back, Pythonistas. Hope you had a nice break. I heard a big um, ah, right when the break started, and I realized we're running late. Um, but we are invigorated by the the beauty of this really cool system. So. The, the next piece of information before we jump in to the demo is what uh, there are a couple of, let's think about a taxonomy of these uh, API servers. So an API server is a program on a computer. It's usually associated with a website. So the example that we'll use tonight is called Donors Choose. And the reason I chose this is because I used to be a high school teacher and a uh, main way that under-resourced teachers can get uh, funding is by posting um, projects that they'd like to get funded uh, on a website called donorschoose.org. And so it allows them to, um, so let's see what kind of teachers are doing projects related to Python. Um, so you can see Ms. Denise King in uh, San Jacinto, California, is trying to get funding for her students who come from a truly rough community where homelessness and job insecurity is apparent, uh, smart charter school, and they want to do a project uh, about um, sports. And so they post a project, and that project has a funding need. So they've had two people donate, and $682 is still needed. And so um, what I want to investigate is how URLs work, because a lot of APIs will be taking apart a URL that you send it in order to decide what to give back to you. Um, and so let's take a, a look at what happens when I type in Python in the donors choose search. Um, so when I did that, I got this URL, not that one, this one, not that one, this one. Um, so here's the URL. URL stands for Universal Resource Locator. locator. Um, and so let me just pop this in here. Um, what you're often uh, doing, oh no, I lost it. Um, okay, so what we've got is the uh, communication protocol. So Hypertext transfer protocol over secure socket, which host, uh, the host at donorschoose.org. Um, the, the link between what we did with the IP addresses and donors choose is that the browser and the internet doesn't know about ASCII characters, D-O-N-R-S-C-H-O-S-E, um, the domain name service that your computer operates seamlessly will translate donorschoose.org into a internet routable address. And so we can find out what that is by looking at the request that we get back from donors choose. So donors choose their computer is uh, found at, uh, where are you? Well, it, it translates into an IP address, and it grabs it. Uh, so the internet, the the internet routing service, will get my request to the computer located at donorschoose.org. Now, let's draw a picture. When that request makes it to the donors choose server, so here's uh, here's me. I saw this really cute. Um, 
little diagram of a person. Um, so there's me on my computer. And so I make a request to HTTP blah, 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 donorschoose.org slash donors slash search that HTML question mark keywords equals Python. So I send this uh, get request to um, donors choose slash blah, blah, blah. Um, their server, so here's their server. So the internet backbone says, I don't care about any of that extra stuff. I'm just trying to get the request to where it goes and I'll let donors choose deal with whatever comes after the donors choose .org. So here's donors choose web server um, that could be running any web, so any web server software that it chooses that's transparent to the routing system. Um, so when it gets into here, there is a, um, a, a routing that happens inside the server program. And usually what's going on inside that server program is it's going to start taking apart the additional pieces of information that are included in that URL. And there is no universal standard. There's only conventions for how servers do this. And it will be specific to each and every server. So my URL went to donors slash search.html. So we could imagine it hits the, um, so the request routing code inside of the server will have a pathway for any request made to uh, slash donors. And so once it makes it to donors, it'll pass off my request to that little part of code. And then donors will say, all right, this is meant for me. And it will split it off. And then at donors, it'll say, oh, this is a request to do a search. So donors, um, maybe one pathway is that someone wants to look up a project or maybe they want to do uh, a search. And so that request, this request is routed to the search.html. And so search will strip off the slash search.html. And then what do we have left? What do we see? We see a, uh, a question mark. And then we have a what? What does this look like? What if I did this? Dictionary. Oh, say it with a little more enthusiasm than that. Dictionary. <laughs> Dictionary. That's that's a very nine twenty eight appropriate eight twenty eight appropriate enthusiasm. So we get a key value pair that is then processed by its search function inside, which will figure out how to turn it into a, a, a query against a database that's sitting uh, down here. And we don't really need to know how that all works. We just need to know how to tell it, I'm giving you a keyword, and that keyword is Python. And so uh, one thing to start tinkering with is if you're if you want an easy problem to solve with your API, um, choose an API where all of the information that you're requesting can be encoded in the URL that you send the server. And so if I come back to donors choose, many of you have probably done this, but if you haven't, this is the time. Um, you, can over, you can sidestep the, um, the form that's used on the browser and just manually edit that URL. So if I want to search for um, robot, I can just change the URL without dealing with the GUI. And the search system will figure out how to generate an HTML page to send back to me. Um, so 
this unpacking of the URL and the careful consideration of how the server needs that URL to be encoded is part of the skills that we're working on in this module. There are norms. The norm is that key value pairs are separated with a question mark um, and the key and the value pair are separated with an equal sign. There, that's, not, that's not internet standard, that's internet convention. Um, and so every API, um, meaning every server that sits at the end of, every server that sits to respond to requests that are made, that are routed to its front door, will unpack that URL in its own specific way, hopefully in a logical way, hopefully in a documented way. Um, and so that makes, that's important because what your Python scripts will want to do if you want to do systematic investigations is you're, you're going to need to piece together a URL string that asks your API server for the information that's relevant to answering your question. Um, and so what I'd like to do is in the last uh, half hour here demonstrate how I might uh, ask the question of can I find patterns in the amount of money required for projects as we vary the different keywords that I search under? So I might imagine that maybe technical projects perhaps might have a higher average project request than uh, materials, um, or maybe trips would be the highest if you want to take your students to Washington, D.C. to study the American political system, I might expect those to have higher uh, average project costs than materials uh, and so forth. So in the API tracker that I posted before, um, under the fall 2020, uh, let, let's put our names in there. Um, I'll put the folks that are in here already. Um, hi, Cliff. Um, so what I'm going to invite you to do is choose an API, give us a link to the documentation, give us a little sentence about why that's interesting to you, and then what's the question. So in my case, um, I've got donors choose. So I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is find the donors choose API documentation page and put this up uh, in my uh, in my spreadsheet. So again, you're going to, the first step is to look for the page designed for people using the API. That's not going to be the general website um, because they, the organization will have had to create the server route that responds to API requests, not browser page requests. Um, so I'm going to paste in this URL into the spreadsheet so that other folks might be able to uh, tinker and learn. So I'm going to paste that in here. Um, and so the rationale for my choice is um, former teacher um, at schools without project funding. And then, so my inquiry question is going to be, um, how do average project request amounts vary by keyword? Do technical projects on average request more money than materials? Okay. So I've, I've set up my, um, my little tracker there. So my next step is to come and start investigating how I would make requests to donors choose. So let's go look at that. Um, so uh, the next thing to note, oh, look, they locked it down. Um, 
So some APIs will require that you include in your request a, um, a key that allows them to track who is making uh, those API requests. And donors choose um, did not used to ask for that. Um, most, most API sites will allow you to request a key uh, for free and to do so uh, rather quickly. But uh, so if you, if you have an API that you think is golden and right up your alley, uh, you know, put the request in right away. I've had some come back in hours and some come back in a month. Um, so uh, that's the first thing to remember is it, it may require a, a key. Um, and then it'll hopefully tell you about how to use it. So our API is simply you make an HTTP request assembled very similar to the donors choose front end, that's the website, and receive classroom projects listing in JSON. The easiest way to build your first search for the projects for the site, um, and then um, request a key. So uh, that's no fun. Uh, so you can see that um, what they are telling us here under JSON requests is these are the things that you will need to tell it in order to get the information back. So you can see they did a nice job of giving you an example of how you would format that, um, that URL request. In our case uh, here, they are asking for, see the key value pairs are separated. So they want keywords and then the keyword value and then a separation of the key value pairs and then API key is the key and then the value is some long API key number. Um, luckily, I have up my sleeve uh, an API from the US federal government that does not require a key. Um, and so we'll go look at that one here, which is the National Highway Transportation Association Crash and Vehicle Recall API which is linked in our API overview. So here in our API project, you can see I have my donors choose stuff. Here's the sample script that I used for making the API request. Um, I, I don't think we'll have time to go through it all, but you can open it up and look at it uh, and see uh, the, basic, uh, the basic structure for um, how I would carry out this request. Um, oh, look, they have a sample. Does that one work? Let's see, we'll see if that one works. Um, the NHTSA site, they, someone screwed up their CSS <laughs> and now it looks really bad. Um, but this is another example of the NHTSA web API that I've linked um, right here, National Highway Traffic Safety Association API list. Um, so I've put all these in for you to uh, start ingesting uh, over time. And so let's, I want to see if the donors choose um, is if they still let their open key work. Um, so I'm actually going to try, let's try run it. I think I ran this earlier and it's still still ran. All right, so here was our, no. Uh, uh, what did I do with our sample? I'm now in full on overload of pages after several hours of teaching. Um, here we go, okay. So let's, let's see if we can get uh, something back from donors choose with their, um, their, general API key. So I'm going to adjust this. And so I'm going to try using the format that they gave me for making HTTP requests. So I'm going to paste in uh, the get request. So you can see what I've got here. This is what we call the API endpoint. 
So um, you'll see that the documentation that we looked at, like the whales one, um, their documentation was designed to be um, flexible if they change the endpoint. So where did you go, whales? Sorry, I'm way overloaded here. You go away. You go away. Where did whales? There's whales over here. No whales, you all go away. Hey, let me open the whales again. So you can see when I'm reading the whales uh, documentation. So their endpoint is this. And then what they're showing you here, this is the this is the the post fix or the this is what you post pend to the endpoint to get various pieces of information. So you're always going to have those two key parts of so the endpoint. So get the request to the right front door, and then once it makes it to the front door, then you give it the specifics on what you want that API server to to get you back. Um, so in our case with donors choose, their endpoint is here, and then um, their their API specifies if you want to get the JSON back, then you tell it JSON feed, and then you give it the keyword, and then you give it a uh, a key. In this case, the donors choose was working, so let's see if it comes back. Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna give it to us. So poor little thing died. So let's try the NHTSA. So if we go to the NHTSA site. Come back, Nitsa. So here's their documentation for um, Office of Defects and Recalls. So maybe we want to figure out which car company is receive is publishing the most recalls. And so once again, here's their documentation. What they're giving us is everything to add to the end once we make it to their endpoint. So that's a key thing for reading this is that they'll usually just give you the end. Um, and then response fields, a list of recalls for the given model, uh, response sample, um, and here's a sample JSON response. So this is they got they have a good documentation. Uh, here's the raw JSON, and here's the browsers are built in because JSON is native to J JavaScript. It will give you the nice key value pairs in a in a pretty little page. So let's um let's uh, try making this work a little bit. Um, so step one: get all model years. Request a list of available model years for a given product type vehicle. Um, response to the list of available model years in the repository. Uh, and so what they're, they're doing a good job of actually showing us that your program may use several successive calls to the API and you'll need to ingest the data you get back in order to formulate the subsequent call to the API. So I'm going to ask it, what are the different models that I could use? And then once I know the model, then I can add that model year um, to my next request uh, and start getting information about a particular model, particular make, and even series. Um, see what BMW is working on. So let's see if we can uh, cook this up. So let's do. 
So I had dug around a little bit and so their endpoint is this. So that'll get me to the front door of their API server. And then what do I do next? So slash API slash recall slash vehicle. So I will want to use this. Notice it'll give me XML or JSON. If I'm using Java, I'm going to use JSON. If I'm using Python, if I'm using Java, I'll use XML. If I'm using Python, I'll use JSON. So see how I, I post pended that. So the best way to do this would not be to hard code it into the get, but rather to make a nice little function like um, build URL request. So this is where we start being nice and modular. So let's, um, let's reorganize, um, let's reorganize my script a little bit. So I'm going to start with, sorry, I need to sit down. I'm going to start with a function that will um, build me a useful uh, URL. So I'm going to move this down here out of the way for just a minute. So let me fix this. So um, let's make a, a build a request URL. Uh, uh, to uh, for sending to and it's an API. So I'm going to start with a global. So I might uh, make it um, API endpoint. So put the the base in there, and then I'm going to build everything I want along the top of that. So now this. So this is my little end bit. So now I'm going to define my function uh, def build. And it's a uh, URL. And I'll figure out what I want to take in here in just a minute. Um, so I'll just say uh, uh, models. Uh, Uh, vehicle models um, route. Okay, and so then what I want to return, I'll just make, we're just making this as simple as possible since it's 848. So I'm going to, um, then I'll make Earl equals API endpoint plus vehicle models route and then I'll return URL. So we could imagine we could start building this out and take in something like um, model and then the builder will know where to put the model inside my URL. So we're just starting simple. So that'll give me back my URL. So now I want, I'll make a function um, uh, uh, make API request, and I'm going to pass in the URL to this function. So this is all going to go inside there. So then what I'm, what I'm getting is a, is a string that I'm building programmatically. So very important. And then if my response status code is 200, I'm going to return the object. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to return the payload. Return payload. Um, else. Uh, can I do that? Maybe. Else return an empty dictionary. So we'll say this um, takes in a URL 
to request against the NHTSA API returns Okay, so now let's just see if we can get this all to work. Um, um, it's a response. So this will be uh, make API request and I'm gonna request uh, build build it's uh, oh I'm supposed to be using my snake case aren't I Cora would be upset with you I know I know I let less please don't forward my <laughs> forward my stuff Coral is, is our is my inspiration for thoroughness in life. Okay. So let's see if we can get a list out. Run those functions. Hope if I spelled it right. Ah, look, it worked. That's so cool. Look at that. So just with what? six minutes of coding I was able to get a big long list of my model years that are available so from here I can start snaking in and doing interesting things so if you want to start getting um, uh, you'll need to decide how much sorting and filtering through this stuff you're gonna need to do um, so uh, what I what I'll probably start doing now is building a more uh, useful NHTSA URL uh, function that that is allows me to get much more specific information um, about the data. So here here is ultimately what I want to be able to. This would get me all the way down to a a make. So I'm going to grab this and adjust my make URL. So um, think about it like um, uh, hold on one sec. So if I, I'm just going to put this in the comments so that I have it. So this works. And so now I'm going to want to build a, um, in my case, the two things I need to replace are the year and the make. So what I'm going to do is build a string for a format a string that can inject a year and a make. Everything else is going to stay the same across um, across my call. So I'm going to take in um, year and make, and so then my route uh, so i'll call this this is uh sample api route and so 
I'm going to grab this, stick it in here, and so this is going to be a string, and this is going to be a string, and then I always forget how to do this. The exact syntax for injecting those. Um, it's actually not called string formatting. I always do this. Uh, is it string interpolation? Yeah, I'm gonna grab my book. String fundamentals. Here's my reference. So this allows us to inject uh, values into my string at various places. That's right, I forgot that it's the it's the percent sign, and then I give it a tuple with the values inside. So that's super handy. What? I know. She always, Lou always gets a little restless around end of class. She's like, all right, we're done. Go come play with me. Everyone's going to be fine. It's okay. Um, okay, so let's, let's make this happen. So this guy is going to be... I should always remember that it's the same same symbol. So then what am I going to pass in? I'm going to put in year comma make, which is cool. Yeah. Um and so I'm going to I'm going to print that out so I can see it. So um uh returned URL Okay, and so that should allow me to say here, I should be able to say year 2000 and show me all the recalls for Saturn. Um, Is that case sensitive in case someone put a capital S for Saturn? Um, it depends on the API. Okay. The general answer in the internet is no, but all bets are off because it's up to what the server decides to do with what it gets. Mod make Saturn.
Oh, I had to make it a string, sorry. Did I put string in? I did put string in quotes, it is a string. Oh, I had two APIs. Oh, look how cool. Okay, so five recalls for Saturn in 2000. Um, no, no, these are the models. These are the models. So now I have to now I have to snake in and do models. Okay, we're getting there. How much time do we have? Oh, no, we did this before. We were down to like, we we're down to nine minutes. Okay, uh, we can do it. I'm back, Nitza. I want you. Okay, so now we can say model year make BMW model make BMW model 3 series. So then we're going to come back and say So you can decide how you want to build this. I would probably have, um, so what I could do now is build programmatically a function that will go through, because I know these are going to be the same, and then the model will be each one of these. So there's an LS, an SC, an SC1, an SL and an SW. So this, this will get me all of this data and then I will, ex I will call each of the models one by one. So build URL so I could call this um uh get models and then i'm going to get this thing back and so then i'm going to make another function that will um build url uh model specific and so then this is going to take in a model and i've got my endpoint so now i'm going to say Trying to think about how I want to make my functions. I'm going to pass in um, the uh, the root and then the specific model. Mm, I don't like how that's going. Um, all right, well, I'll let you deal with the guts and we'll just put model in here. <laughs> okay. So then this would need to be slash model slash put in another string. Uh, is that what Nitsa said? Uh, 
Yep, model, and then I stick the model in there. All right, we can do that in five minutes. Come back, come back. Good, and so then here, model. So I wanna actually get to see some recalls because that's the useful data. Um, now, one, one way that I could make this, <clears throat> I can make, what I'll do is I'll make this more flexible. So let's say um, if uh, you gotta pass in a, a year and a make, and if model, um, uh, if model is not none, then I'm gonna build this. Um, else I'm going to build it without the model. So that way I can use the same method to get the models and to build a URL to have one without model and one with model. Not, not a great design, but we're on a pinch here. So we, we start with something that works. Okay, so if I pass in a model, then I get that good so it's kind of cool because you as long as you have the the same the same base you can start making you can get all sorts of different kinds of data just by manipulating the the URL um, so now if I say I don't like you you're dead to us Okay, so now if I say um, SC, let's see if it works. Anyone know what the problem is? It's Capital N on none, the weird Python, true and false. They love their capitals. Can't believe they get away. Oh, look, there they are. Seven recalls for the SE model. Um, manufacturer, General Motors, powertrain, automatic transmission, park neutral start switch. Summary, vehicle description. Certain passenger vehicles equipped with automatic transaxles fail to comply with the requirements of FMVSS N number 114 theft protection. These vehicles were built with an improperly adjusted automatic transactional park lock cable assembly. If improperly adjusted, it is possible to shift from the park position with the ignition key removed. Not fun. Easy to steal a car like that. And push it away from the parking lot. Consequence, this condition increases the risk of a crash. Oh, even worse, intended from the unintended movement of parked vehicles. Remedy, Sadden is asking owners retail to perform a functional check of the automatic transactional park lock cable. Um, let's see what another one is. Some of these sound really awful. Um, vehicles were built with an inadequate vent valve weld on the top portion of the fuel tank. Fuel spillage could occur during refueling or a vehicle were involved in a rollover. Great. If an ignition source were present, a fire could occur. Remedy, dealers will inspect the vehicle to ensure the fuel tank vent tap valve is properly welded. Um, oh no, here we go. Seatbelt assembly anchorages. Some of the vehicles were produced with a seatbelt shoulder guide anchor bolt that were not adequately tightened at the center pillar and could fall out, making the seatbelt inoperative. Consequence, in the event of a crash, the seat occupant may not be properly restrained. That means fly through the windshield. Um, makes you not want to drive anymore. Um, some of the vehicles are manufactured with welds in the instrument panel carrier assembly that do not meet SA turn quality standards. Consequence, a front seat occupant, particularly in an unbelted occupant, may have an increased risk of injury in a frontal crash. Um, oh no, here we go. Gets, I think they ordered them in, in order of, of death likelihood. Um, passenger car brake systems. These vehicles were produced with brake pipe attachment nuts that may not be tightened to specifications. If the brake pipe nuts are not properly tightened, brake fluid leakage could occur, increasing the brake stopping distance. 
Um, luckily, most cars are made with uh, redundant brake um, hydraulic systems, so you usually get half your brakes even if one of them goes out. Okay, so, oh good, 23 seconds. Sorry, I shouldn't have read the, the brake one. That was too scary. So, um, questions. That's API. The whole world is now available at your fingertips. Once you know how to adjust URLs and build them systematically, you can decide all the cars you don't want to buy. Um, questions? So uh, what I was gonna say, not yet. Let me try and break it and break the internet yeah. and see what happens. Good, good, good. So um, the only thing I'm asking you to do for next week is get get your bearings in the API world. Choose an API. Tink, see if you can make a simple get request. See if it makes it in, um, and then we'll start workshopping these next week. I think on our schedule I have API posted for all of next week um, as well. So this is. This is a neat project that we'll take a couple weeks on, and then we'll take a brief interlude and do our um, our peer presentations. Yep. So next week we'll do we'll figure out where people are, um, and then we'll next week we'll assign the peer teaching topics. So make sure that you come next week, and we'll sign you up, and then we'll do those for a week or two. Hey Eric, can I, um, when we're done here, can I show you what I came up with on the JSON? Yeah, for sure. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, any, any other questions for the whole group? Um, there's a lot to chew on this week. Choose an interesting API to find something that you're inherently interested in because there's plenty of tinkering to do. Eric, is there a way to pull up images in an image API? Or do we have sure. to use JSON? Uh, it'll come in a J it'll it'll give you the bits in, in hexadecimal form in the JSON blob. Yeah, I saw that, but I was like, it's just a bunch of text, and I'm not sure like how to turn it into the image. Yeah, you'll need to get you'll need to find an image processing module that will take hexadecimal and turn it into pixels. I don't even know what those are. Okay. But that'd be a fun little project. Yeah, it looks, that's great. Seems cool. Yeah. Um, I'm, it's in Python. It's probably like two lines of code. You'd probably like image viewer dot parse hex, and then you'd probably just give it the value of whatever the key for the image was in the JSON. Okay. Uh, my suggestion: if you are using um, Jupyter notebooks, you probably have the easiest likelihood in there because Jupyter yeah. has a lot of support for automatically opening windows for different kinds of display types. Yep. Yeah. Great. Cool. Other questions for the whole group? All right, this was a good long night and um, I appreciate your fortitude and inspiration. Uh, oh no, I erased Jill's quote. I think the, the quote was um, the, the wrestling, the, the muddling is part of the learning. What was it, Jill? The struggle is The struggle, it. yes. <laughs> the struggle is inherent in the learning and uh, so I, I wish you well in your struggles and have a lovely week and I'll stick around for questions. Have a good weekend. See ya. Thanks. See, See ya. ya.